Hello, hello, hello. Long time no see. How have you been? 2023 is a year where some movies released. Thank you, thank you. Now, you may be thinking, it's October 2024. Why the hell are you doing a video on films that are now old, stuffy and decrepit? They released nearly a full year ago. They're way too past their expiration date. Well, I initially wrote this script back in early January when these films were fresh spring chickens. And now there are two options as to what happened next. Either my freelance filmmaking work picked up, where I've been writing, directing, producing and editing on some incredible projects, collaborating with so many talented artists and having the absolute time of my life with barely a moment to breathe. Or I intentionally wrote this video and put it in a vault, only to be released 10 months after finishing the script so that it can teach a valuable lesson that art is eternal and films exist past their respective award seasons and release windows, utterly refuting the fact that movies are disposable entertainment made on a conveyor belt to be consumed and forgotten about. Oi, eyes back up here. Yes, that's it, let's go with the second option, I'm a genius. So, movies in 2023. You may have missed some of them, or you may not have. I don't know you or your life other than what Mark Zuckerberg has told me. So here are some films ranked from most stressful to least stressful. I'm not declaring these to be the best of the year or anything arbitrary like that, just some hidden gems that may have fallen by the wayside of conversation, or have still been a part of conversation but I want to peer pressure you into a rewatch. Some of them were even nominated for and won Oscars, but what are you going to do? First, let's just do a few quickfire ones. The Boy and the Heron is a touching look at leaving childhood behind. Poor Things is of course a superb piece of work all round. If you need a burst of joy in your life, then Nimona is the family film for you. Zone of Interest and Killers of the Flower Moon are just beyond words. Harrowing pieces we'll be revisiting for years. How to Have Sex is devastating. Please look up what it's about before watching to make sure you're in the right headspace for it. Horde is a breathtaking feature debut from Luna Carmoon that left me speechless after the screening. Anatomy of a Fool is such a fascinating deconstruction of our obsession with true crime. And finally, I'm such a slut for sci-fi. Asteroid City, I love you so much. Final thing before getting into the full list, it's a strange time to be discussing movies, given everything that's happening in the world. So I just wanted to leave a link in the description to donate if you're able and help the crucial humanitarian aid reach the people of Gaza and now Lebanon, as well as other areas in desperate need of support. I first wrote this months ago and the fact that the situation has only gotten worse is devastating. Please, everyone, make sure your voices are heard globally as we call for peace to save lives. Contact your elected officials and hold them to account. Don't be silent. Thank you. So, if your idea of a good time is for a stressful film that keeps escalating, getting worse and worse by the second because every conceivable thing is going wrong for the characters, leaving you holding your beta breath with so much tension until suddenly you burst out laughing because it's too funny, then Cobweb is for you. Directed by Kim Ji-Woon, who has also made the harrowing I Saw the Devil and A Tale of Two Sisters, he sets his latest film in the 1970s following director Kim, a passionate filmmaker who after the initial wrap of his newest film dreams of a new perfect ending, one to surely make it a masterpiece. So before the demolition of the set, and crucially before the ending has been approved by the Korean censorship board, he must try to rally up the actors and producers who don't understand the new ending whilst trying to hide from the censorship authorities who decide to take a visit on that very day. Chaos and turmoil grip the set, which I'm sure any filmmaker can relate to, as the doors are chained shut and no one can leave. It surprised me how invested I got into these characters, fully understanding their motivations and wanting to yell at the screen when there's a misunderstanding. Because everything is so tightly set up, then later paid off, it's as precise as an Agatha Christie novel, and it's truly an amazing comedy to see with a crowd perfect for getting some mates round, opening a few bevs and sticking this on. The audience I saw this with were all in hysterics and it was such a joyous feeling. It's amazing to watch some comedies that aren't just comedians improvising in a two shot, but see one that is directed and executed so damn well. You'll struggle to predict any of what happens and my god, you'd be hard pressed to not find cobwebs entertaining as hell. Secondly, a film which seems to be doing really well in America, but over here in the UK, I've been banging on about it to anyone who'll listen. It sounded like a madman because it's really flown under the radar here. But The Holdovers is truly the prime example of the phrase, they don't make movies like this anymore. And in the UK, I know this didn't come out in 2023. I'm painfully aware because you know what? You US folk, good for you. I'm glad you got your perfect Christmas movie at Christmas. That sounds really great for you. I'm not at all confused as to why they would release a Christmas movie in January. <clears throat> um, sorry about that. Uh, the Holdovers is great. 
It follows everyone's favorite burger enjoyer, Paul Giamatti, as an unpopular boarding school teacher who's punished to look after a group of kids who can't go home over the Christmas holidays. It was rightfully sweeping up acting awards and it couldn't be better deserved. Giamatti is always sublime. Devine Joy Randolph breaks your heart and Dominic Sessa gives me an existential crisis that he is somehow younger than me and is also absolutely phenomenal in the film. What a debut. One of my favorite things about The Holdovers is that when the credits roll, you feel like you've read a great American novel. What classic Hollywood used to be best at is telling a story. And that's what David Hemmingson perfectly crafts in his script. All of these people grow and change so subtly throughout the narrative, you feel like you're growing with them. Alexander Payne brings such an astute eye to the filmmaking that the craft on display is so impressive yet invisible at the same time, leaving you completely lost in the story. Go and seek this Blu-ray out the second it becomes available, then put it on the mantelpiece. Pry to place and wait, don't worry about the fishy smell, let the seasons roll by, perhaps read some Marcus Aurelius to fill the time, and the moment you're after a winter film to put you in the festive spirit, only then can you break the glass in case of an emergency. Gather everyone you love in December to enjoy the holdovers. A small comment to the previous remark. That was a lot funnier when it was planned to be said in January. Now in October, it's just a reasonable and intelligent amount of thinking ahead for the holidays. Even so, watch and enjoy the holdovers. Sir, I don't understand. That's glaringly apparent. I can't fail this class. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Mr. Coates. I truly believe that you can. Last year, as a film critic, I had the opportunity to attend a number of film festivals. Both of the previous two films I caught at the BFI London Film Festival back in October last year. But this next one I saw at the fantastic Belfast International Film Festival last November. City of Wind is a beautiful story about the clash between cultural tradition and contemporary life. Following Z, a 17-year-old, who is the local spiritual shaman in his Mongolian village who everyone uses for emotional and moral guidance. It then shows him at school trying to juggle his spiritual responsibilities on top of being a teenager as he starts to fall in love. Especially as our world is thrust forward into a digital age with everyday life having changed so rapidly in the last few hundred years, it's fascinating to see how that interacts with classic traditions that have been around for centuries. Knowing the weight, importance and heritage of being a spiritual shaman whilst also trying to live your own life in a world that's skeptical of if being a shaman is even real or not. Battling between two identities, knowing one is so much bigger than yourself. It feels too reductive to make the joke that this is a spiritual Mongolian Spider-Man, <laughs> so I'll refrain. City of Wind is a fascinating directorial debut from a filmmaker who has such a specific vision with a lot of care given to every detail. A stunning film starring amazing performances that is so effective at immersing you into the story that you can smell the air, feel the grass, and enjoy spending time with Z and Marala, showing how deeply singular everyone's lives are, yet eternally universal. Now, for a film that a lot of folks have been talking about, and rightfully so. If you've seen it, then great. Hopefully, this can at least encourage a rewatch of Past Lives, a beautiful, quietly devastating film that plays on all of the what ifs in your life. Nora and Hei Sung are two childhood friends with a deeply strong connection. After Nora's family emigrates to America, cutting their friendship short, we see them 20 years later getting back in touch, both the same people yet living different lives. Nora even now in a serious relationship with someone else. Nothing is more devastating than the passing of time. Having someone that at one point you were so sure would be in your life forever become another name on your phone screen as you mindlessly scroll is a feeling I'll never get used to. Nora's partner Arthur deserves an award for world's chillest dude. He gives Nora the space she needs to figure out what she's thinking and feeling in her own time. And he feels like quite a postmodern character, very aware of what the traditional love stories say and his role in those as a potentially evil boyfriend, keeping her from her one true childhood love. I watched this incredibly sleep deprived after flying back from filming in Budapest, so potentially my emotional guard was too down, but my God, this film hit hard. The tears just didn't stop. I said in my review, but it feels like Celine Song sits in the seat next to you and gently asks you about your own life and experiences with love. She's a bold new cinematic voice telling such a delicate and fragile story. Past Lives is a film that will stay with you because you won't want to let it go. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And on Netflix in the UK. Now, for a documentary that will bring you nothing but joy, this is going to be big, 
tells the story of a group of neurodiverse Australian teenagers as they navigate the world, school, and most importantly, their first high school musical, which is about time traveling to see Australian musician royalty, John Farnham, at different stages of his career. This is an incredibly unique film, and one that made me feel a lot of emotions. Even when tearing up at certain emotional moments, I had a huge smile on my face. The perseverance, strength, and humor all of these young people have and bring to everyday life is inspiring, and it highlights how important art is, both to those who experience it, as well as create it. Art gives us as humans emotional sustenance. I can't imagine my life without it. We communicate ideas and make people feel. What could be better than that? The kids the film follows progress quite a bit over the course of the year. With health and family issues arising, their quick Australian wit is never far away. Bringing levity to heavy moments, it'll have you smiling every time you think about it. A quality film. I'll be doing a full video essay on this, just as a heads up. If anyone has taken some milk out of the staff room, if they could put it back, that would be great. Thank you. So, they're the films. It's been quite a brilliantly hectic year, hence why this has come so late, but my god it's been good fun making movies. Last year was a big year for me film-wise, working on my then larger scale projects, some even international, which I'm excited to share more about soon. Also I went freelance full-time, what an exciting, scary and fun endeavour. I'm having a blast. I hope you're all well, are safe and enjoying some good movies. Again, if you're able to donate to help those in need, please, please do. The links are below.